going to be in the book of Luke this morning, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? All right, we're in two, uh, two chapters of Scripture this week, Luke 18 and Luke 11. Two similar parables. This is our last week in parables. We've been going through parables throughout uh, the summer, and this is our last week doing, uh, doing that, although it's been a lot of... Uh, a lot of fun and enjoyable and fruitful, and uh, next week we'll be beginning in the book of Romans. So if you want to be preparing for our time in the book of Romans throughout 2020 and 21, you can begin reading that, try a chapter a day, and between now and next Sunday, you could read through uh, chapter 7 of Romans, you'll have a good uh, start on our time there. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18, the parable of the pesky widow and the parable of the persistent friend over in Luke chapter 11. So by way of... Uh, getting our minds thinking about this. The marathon is one of the marquee events of the Summer Olympics. Always has been, really, since the modern Olympics has been around, 26-mile race. Uh, usually, a lot of times in the Summer Olympics, the marathon is the last athletic event of the Olympics, and oftentimes the medal ceremony for the marathon is uh, included with the closing ceremony of the Olympics. So it's kind of, I guess, a big deal. And it was no different in 1908 when the American Johnny Hayes was running in second place to a British runner, uh, which I don't know his name because he's not an American, right? Um, second place. As the British runner was running into the stadium to make the final lap, the American runner in second place was 10 minutes behind him. That's a long ways. 10 minutes behind him. Johnny uh, was behind this guy. So the British runner runs in. But here's the little backstory of this British runner. At about the mile 20 marker, he started noticing that the person who at that point was in the first place was starting to get a little, starting to waver a little bit. So he turned it on a little bit, kicked it into high gear. And so for the last six miles, he really cranked it out. And when he was entering that stadium, he was completely dehydrated. He was disoriented. He couldn't figure out which way was up, down, sideways. He stumbled into the stadium Ten minutes ahead of the American, fell to his feet, fell to his knees. He was assisted up by one of the umpires. And the umpire pointed him, go that way. He had to be continually be guided the correct way to go around the track because he was completely disoriented. He stumbled down multiple times. Finally, finishing the finish line in first place, 30 seconds ahead of the American runner who came in second. Took him nearly 10 minutes to make that final lap Around. One other thing about um, the Olympics back then that's different than now. The host country would provide all of the umpires, all of the judges, all of the referees for the Olympics. That seems fair. <laughs> so this British runner, where was the Olympics held in London? Uh, the Olympics were held in London in 1908. That's a, can't take, 1908, they were in London. So all of the umpires that were helping this runner up and go the right direction were British. Helping get it going, get going, you got it, you're gonna make it. So of course, immediately the Americans, as we like to do, we filed a complaint. As it turns out, it was agreed upon. This guy was disqualified. He would have never finished the race had, it, had he not received aid from his, uh, his umpires that were his fellow countrymen. So here's the thing about Johnny Hayes. He was running 10 minutes out. The best he could do was second place unless he faltered. There was no way he could make it. And what I want this to remind us of is this, as we get into these parables. He didn't know what the future hold, but the one thing he knew he could do was keep going and just let that stuff work itself out. And when he got there, unbeknownst to him, he crossed the finish line second, but he got the gold medal. 
And this is what we're going to see in the persistent widow or the pesky widow and the persistent friend. We don't know what the future holds, but we're just going to keep after it and see what is going to happen. And what does this persistence speak to specifically? It speaks here to pursuing the Lord through prayer. So there's really a basic idea this morning that I want us to settle our hearts on. It's this, pursue the Lord. Two ideas, one from each parable. The first parable in Luke 18, it's this, pursue the Lord, don't lose heart because God is just. Pursue the Lord, don't lose heart because God is just. We'll look at it in the second parable in Luke chapter 11, pursue the Lord, don't give up because God is kind. Don't give up because God is kind. So we're going to look at two ideas. So if you want to, go back to Luke 18. Uh, Pat read it for us, but let's just review a couple of things about this parable. First thing about this parable in Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus does something in this parable that he rarely does for any of his parables, and it's fantastic. He tells us exactly what he wants us to learn. Look at Luke 18, verse 1. He told them a parable to, to the effect they should always pray and not lose heart. Wouldn't it be great every time you picked up the Bible, it started that way? Sometimes we read it and we go, I have no idea what this means or what I'm supposed to do with it. This particular parable, Jesus says, here, let me give it to you straight up. I want you to always pray and not lose heart. And he describes this parable, pursue the Lord, don't lose heart. Why would we do this? Because God is just. He tells this parable of this widow. And back in those days, the widow's in that time were the most vulnerable, among the most vulnerable of their population. She would have likely been impoverished. She would have had no influential friends. She would have had no means to address this injustice on her own. The only means she had to get justice somehow, Jesus doesn't tell us, she had been wronged by somebody and she needed it made right. She didn't have the power or the influence or the resources of the friends to make it right on her own. So she was going to this judge. And this judge was a useless and worthless judge. Jesus tells us in the parable his nature. He did not care about God or about people. And what do we know about the the Old Testament as as a covenant promise to the people of God? Jesus said this, all of the law, all of Moses and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What are they? Do you remember? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What is this judge love? Not God, not neighbor. So what Jesus has done in this parable is he has put in the place of this judge someone who is the exact opposite of what God was seeking to do in his covenant people. And this was the judge this woman had to go and pursue. So she would go and say, listen, I've been wrong. I'm going to file the paperwork. I'm going to pay the fee. I should be heard. And he would tell her day after day after day, get out of here. I don't care. I don't care about God. I don't care about you. I don't care about your adversary. Take a hike. So what does this widow have? She's got no money. She's got no friends. She's got no influence. She's got no opportunity. What is the one thing this widow has? She's got the Lord. Yes, absolutely. You're right on. But let me make another point too. Great point though. (laughs) She's got time. She's got, oh, you're going to tell me no? I'm going to make you tell me no till the cows come home. There is one thing I got. I got time because I'm a widow. You know, I got nothing else to do. I got nothing else. So I'm going to be here every single day until the Lord calls me home or the cows come home. Either way, right? And so she's got nothing. So she's going to take what she does have and just persist. And finally, this judge says, and you can see it in the parable, he says, you know what? Let me just make it clear I haven't had a change of heart. I still don't care about God. I still don't care about people. Least of all, I don't care about this widow. However, to give myself some peace so she might leave me alone and not wear me out with her coming, I'm going to give her what she wants. So just to get her out of my sight. And Jesus' argument is just, it's a very, very simple argument. If an evil judge will give what is needed to get a pesky person to go away, what would a good God like God do for those who persist in coming to him for justice? And the answer is this, he will not delay in providing justice to those who seek him. Since God is just, And since God cares deeply, he is saying, continually seek me through persistent pursuit, persistent prayer, that he might provide what is needed in the moment. Endurance, that he might provide in the moment. Strength. Since God is just, keep pursuing him. I want to add a little wrinkle to this in 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. 
1 Samuel 1.10, we pick up the story of a woman named Hannah. And you're familiar with Hannah. Hannah is the mother of Samuel. And Hannah was unable to have children, and she was very upset about this, and, and rightfully so. As, as is today, not able to have children is very distressing. In those times, I might even suggest it was even more distressing because there was great religious and cultural shame that a woman carried not being able to have children. We carry some of that even today, but then it was even more overt than it is now. And she carried this shame with her. God must be against me if I'm able to have children. Every year, her and her husband would go up to the temple to pray. And so one of these times, she was in prayer, in deep distress. This is verse 10. And she was weeping bitterly, and she vowed. She made a promise. God, if you'll look on my affliction... If you will hear your servant's prayer, if you will grant me a son, I will devote him to your service in the temple always. Yeah, I will give him to you. Look at verse 12. I think it's on the screen or it's in your copy of the scripture. She kept praying and Eli observed her mouth. Who's Eli? Eli is the high priest. Eli is the one that the people would go to to gain access to God through prayer. So they go to the priest with their sacrifice, with their offerings, and the priest was the one that was to mediate the relationship between the people and God. He was to provide the avenue for them to have access to God. That's his whole job. And Eli's not a terrible guy. I would say he's average. The one thing he did wrong is he had two terrible sons, and his sons were doing terrible things. They were sleeping with the female attendants in the temple, and they were also abusing the offerings. They were taking whatever they wanted from the people's offerings instead of taking what the Lord had granted to the priests through the offerings. They didn't like what the Lord had granted, so they took whatever they want. They were abusing their office to satisfy their own fleshly desires and to eat whatever they wanted. And what Eli should have done is removed his sons from priestly office. And he never did that. He continued to serve in the temple, and Eli never did that. So he's not a terrible guy, but he, he certainly was not what I'd call our moral example in this situation. So here is Hannah, seeking the Lord's uh, grace in her life, seeking the Lord's provision in her life, doing it the right way, going through God's priest. And what does the priest say to her? Look at it. It's unbelievable. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but her lips were moving, but no noise was coming out. God knew what she was praying in her heart and mind. Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Can you believe this guy? She's distressed in her heart, years and years, pleading to the Lord. And, the, and God's high priest, the one appointed by God's covenant, says, what, do you, what did you show up to church drunk for? And she says, no, 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 I'm not drunk. And so she has to explain herself to this priest. Okay, see how well I did editing my language? Lord, Lord, I'm, 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 a, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Somehow the spirit moved in Eli and he understood what she was pleading for. He recognized God was going to hear her prayer and he blessed her. And she recognized that meant God was going to answer her prayer. Here, we're going to stop there. If you want to read the rest of the story, you can do that. Here's what I want us to, to notice here. She is seeking the Lord persistently year after year after year to this kind of priest. A priest that when she shows up, he becomes her chief accuser. That when she shows up, the priest points out very quickly why she shouldn't be there. And why she shouldn't be praying. I want us to just very quickly now shift gears and think about our high priest. The book of Hebrews described Jesus as our great high priest. Who was appointed to that position not because he was born of the tribe of Levi. Because he wasn't. He became our high priest because of his indestructible life. And now he stands at the right hand of the father. Constantly making intercession for us. So then we come to our high priest and say, I need access to God. And does he accuse us? Absolutely not. He doesn't accuse us. The difference being, Eli didn't know what was wrong with Hannah. Was Hannah a sinner? Yes, because she was a human. He accused her of something she wasn't doing. If he was going to accuse her of something, at, at the very least, he could have at least named something she was actually doing wrong. Jesus, on the other hand, knows everything we actually are doing wrong and does not accuse us. He recognizes that by faith, all of that was paid for on the cross. So the one who ought to accuse us 
doesn't because we have a better high priest. Our high priest recognizes by his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, there is no longer an accusation. In fact, he goes to the father and says, I paid for it. So you, you got to listen to everything this person is going to seek from you. And this is our high priest. We have a good high priest. We have one who is seeking our best, is not accusing us. We don't have to lose heart in prayer because God is not a cruel judge. God is not a cruel priest looking down his long religious nose, looking for reasons why he doesn't have to answer. He looks to his right, sees his son who has paid for our sin and says, what do you got? I want to hear it. He sees us. He knows us. He, in fact, I would suggest this. He feels what we're feeling in the hardship. We recognize in the stress and turmoil of I need God to intervene. God is not absent from that stress and turmoil. He knows what's going on in our inner person with the anxiety and the fear and the questioning. And he says, come to me with all of that. I know exactly what's going on. He is a good judge. So what is our motivation to pursue the Lord? What is our motivation to not lose heart in pursuing the Lord? Is because he is just and he hears us because Christ paid for it all. There is no longer an accusation. Look at the end of, of this parable. Luke 18, verse 8. Jesus applies this parable. He says, about, he says, I tell you, God will give justice to those who seek it speedily. He will not delay. But listen to this last sentence. There's a little bit of a twist on this parable we've got to pay attention to. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Okay, did you just change topics? Where is this coming from? Why is this end this way? And let me, let me explain why he ends this way. Here's what Jesus understands that we sometimes fail to understand. We have today, and then we have that day when we're going to see the Lord. It's going to be either the great day of the Lord or the day we punch out graduate, we call that your funeral or my funeral. So what these, these days are coming. Now you can't stop either the day of the Lord, we're going to see him, or we're going to check out in this, uh, this life, move on to the next, and we're going to see the Lord. The question is, are we going to endure with the Lord from, he, from today until that day? It turns out there's a lot of things that are going to happen between now and that day that we can't predict. Anybody predict this week? I mean, somebody joked about it on the radio. He said, at this point in the United States, we wake up each morning to figure out which page of Revelation we're on, right? I mean, we have no idea what tomorrow holds. You know, there's a red flag warning this afternoon, right? We're all going, so what's going to happen? Is it, are we going to roll out again? Another level three, get out of your house situation? We don't know. And so the question is, how do we get from now till that day, knowing the, that we have no idea what's coming, how do we endure to the end? And Jesus is making it quite clear. We cannot endure to the end on our own. We must have the power of God in order to endure what's going to come. The, a great false statement has been said, God never gives us more than we can handle. Anybody buy that this week? God routinely gives us more than we could handle. If God only gave us what we could handle, we would never need to seek him. And in fact, God on a regular basis gives us more than we can handle. That we might seek him. The only way we can endure till the end is if we are relying on the strength of the Lord, and the primary way we rely on the strength of the Lord is to pursue Him in persistent prayer the way this widow did. We need His strength, and to have His strength, we need to seek Him in our weakness. So we are motivated for God's justice. We are motivated that God might intervene. We are motivated that God might provide. We are motivated that God might help. But at the end of the day, our prayers are motivated and moved by that we might find God. And that we might endure to the end until we stand before him on that great day. Because without him, it's going to be hard to make it. Pursue the Lord. Don't lose heart. God is just. Okay, just a quick idea before we move on to the other parable, if you don't mind. Do you mind? Don't care. Um, No, I do care. I shouldn't say that. The smoke's making me irritable. Um, We could say a lot of things about our prayer. So there, there are a number of things you might evaluate. If you think about your praying... We might think about our, I'm thinking about mine too, so I'm not throwing, throwing this on you. Uh, and if this bothers you, this, is, this applies only to uh, the first service. We can think a lot about our prayer. We can, might say maybe, maybe our prayers are a little bit too self-centered. Maybe. We might say that. You say, you know, I pray about myself more than I pray about others. Or I pray about 
uh, people who are really closely related to me because uh, I pray that these people might have a good day because if they're having a good day, it turns out I have a good day. You know, that, and so we pray really kind of maybe self-centered prayers. Maybe we might suggest we pray for physical things more than spiritual things. You know, we pray that way, God, I need my daily bread. God, pay this bill. God, I hold the car works. God, I hope I get healed. These are all things we should be praying for. But, you know, maybe we don't pray quite as much as we should about God, help me overcome sin. God, help me today to say no to sin and say yes to obedience. God, help me today to, to say no to my desires and yes to what somebody else wants to serve others. Uh, God, maybe today I could walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Um, you know, maybe we pray more about physical things than God, help me to endure, help me to be faithful. Um, what are spiritual things? And, uh, and maybe, we spend, maybe we pray a lot about things that are in our orb of understanding. Yes, we pray a lot for our country and we should pray a lot for our church and our should and but how, do we pray for the people around the world that are suffering? You know, we've had a bad week, and there are Christians around the world who have, bad, have, have had, had a bad decade. And, uh, you know, and so these are all things that we think, well, maybe I could pray. These are some ways uh, that, um, that I could, could see my prayer uh, be more faithful to God's calling. But I would suggest there's one thing that our prayer uh, it can't be criticized about. And maybe I'm just talking about me because I don't want you to feel guilty much. Just a little. Are we at risk of wearing God out? I mean, obviously you're saying, well, no, you can't wear God out. Okay. Say you could. Let's just hypothetically, let's say you could wear, wear God out. Let's just pretend. Are we in pretend mode? Are we, are we still at risk of wearing God out? But, I mean, this is the thing. That what Jesus calls us to, don't lose heart. Pursue the Lord. In what way are we to pursue the Lord? Pursue the Lord in such a way that your goal is to wear him out. That finally he's going, you know what? I get it. Okay, fine. Now, God would never respond that way, but that's what he's saying. Our pursuit of the Lord is, uh, is not to wear him out kind of thing. It's more of here and there, bad day, so I'm going to seek the Lord. And this is what God is saying. He says, seek the Lord to wear him out. And he will never be worn out. But this is one of the things I think the primary way is we could take praying as a part of our walk with the Lord and make it the thing instead of a thing. Pursue the Lord. Don't lose heart. God is just. Okay, turn over to Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at the other parable uh, for just a few minutes. There's a great movie that came out. I don't think it was a Christian movie. I'm going to mention it nonetheless. It is called Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Who's seen it? Yeah, we, we, I know you're watching it. Right now, people in the room are on their cell phone pulling up Disney+. Plus. That's great. I'm watching that movie. Here we go. Enjoy. Okay? Pirates of the Caribbean. So at the beginning of the film, uh, one of the main protagonists, Elizabeth Swan, she's on the Black Pearl, and she's negotiating with Captain Barbosa. At the time, she has given, though, Captain Barbosa the name Elizabeth Turner because she loves him. Orlando Bloom. It's oh. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I've lost you, right? Um, so she's given the name uh, Elizabeth Turner. And here's the negotiation. Get back with it. Here's the negotiation. She's got this gold medallion that Captain Barbosa wants. And uh, the negotiation is this. Captain Barbosa has agreed to stop attacking her hometown and to leave if she will give him the gold medallion. And they agreed. Good job. Okay, so she gives the gold medallion, and he begins to sail away. And Elizabeth Turner says, or Elizabeth Swan says to Captain Barbosa, uh, well, you've you got to take me back home. He goes, well, that wasn't a part of our negotiations. And since that wasn't a part of our negotiations, I can't take you home. Since you didn't ask for it, I just simply can't. My hands are tied. I can't give it to you. And then he says with great flourish, welcome to the Black Pearl, Miss Turner. Right? And it's a great movie. See, now you're watching it. Here's my point. Many of us think this is how God answers our prayers. He is looking for every little loophole to get out of actually giving us what we're asking for. Like he's the meanest genie he's the, who's ever existed. I'm going to ask for this, and he's going to figure out how to parse our words in such a way to answer our prayer, but ruin our day. And this is not what God is like, and that's precisely what this parable is intended to reveal over in Luke chapter 11, is pursue the Lord, don't give up, because God, unlike Captain Barbosa and unlike our imaginations about him, God is actually kind. God is, his, his, his nature is a nature of Kindness. So turn over to, uh, if you're not already there, Luke chapter 11. Jesus was in a certain place. His disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, and he teaches them the Lord's Prayer or the disciples' prayers, it is often called, and then he tells this parable. 
If we have time, we'll get back to the Lord's Prayer in a minute, but let's start with the parable. So he says this, a friend has somebody, a guest show up at midnight at his house. A friend shows up in town, he's a guest, he shows up at midnight, knocks on the door, can I stay at your place? And the friend says, of course you can't get in here. The rules of hospitality at that time would require it. The rules of hospitality at that time would also require a meal to be served. And unfortunately at midnight, this guy has no bread to serve, which would be customary to be served. He has no bread baked. And the, and the market has long since shut down for the night. So he goes next door to his neighbor to ask his neighbor for some bread to provide for his friend who is visiting from out of town. And again, this isn't terribly unusual. Uh, the culture of that time, the homes were arranged in such a way, there was a much more communal and neighborhood community sense. They, they would have shared meals on a routine basis. The person is probably going to ask him for bread next door because he knew at the evening meal there was bread left over. That's the reason he's going over there. There's, there's a sense of community sharing. It would have been necessary both for protection as well as providing for one another's needs. The issue is the hour. It's midnight. And just like now, someone's showing up at midnight. That's kind of a pain. So the guy knocks on the door. Hey, buddy, I need some bread. Somebody showed up and I need some bread. Could you get me some bread? I know you got some left. You got some of that great seven grain Dave's Killer bread on the shelf. I saw it. And, uh, and the friend goes, listen, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. The floor is freezing. I don't want to get out of bed. Go away. And so his friend keeps pounding on the door. I need some bread. I'm going to leave when I have bread. You're going to sleep when I leave. Do you see the connection? And this is exactly what he's doing. He's just going to pound on the, pound the door. And Jesus' point is this. Will his friend provide him bread to get him to go away? The answer is yes. Because he knows he's not going to get any sleep unless he just gets up to give the guy some bread. And by his argument, he says, well, then won't God in your persistence hear your prayer? Won't God, who is kind and always available, hear and respond to your prayer? Look at verse 8, 9, and 10, and Jesus summarizes God's attitude. I tell you, though he will not get up and give anything just because he is his friend, it's because of his impudence he will rise and give him what he needs. I tell you, Excuse me, ask and it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock and it will be opened. Everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. In fact, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will instead give him a scorpion? If you as sinners know how to give your kids good gifts, how much more so will God, who is good, provide good gifts to you? So Jesus' argument here is, God, unlike this neighbor, and God, in a similar way to good fathers, gives that which is good. Pursue the Lord, don't give up, because God, in fact, is kind. And he hears, and he wants to respond favorably when we seek him uh, with our prayers. Okay, just a quick thing. Go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 11. His disciples came to him and said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And do you find that strange? I mean, how hard is it? You start with, hey, God, can I have this? I mean, it's not complicated. Why in the world would the disciples be asking Jesus how to pray? And they even made reference to the fact that John's disciples were being taught how to pray. You got to teach us how to pray. Here's the thing. Because the disciples understood to follow a rabbi is to be taught in how to see God. To follow a rabbi in being taught how to see God means you are going to be taught how to pray. Why? Because prayer is primarily what religion is for. Think about all of the world religions around, uh, around the world throughout history. Muslim, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. Muslim, Islam. Think of them all. The primary reason religion exists is to provide the correct avenue for an individual to make connection with whatever deity that that deity might intervene. So you, you've got a, a list of rules and a list of obligations and a list of ceremonies. You do A, B, C, and D, give this, do this, stop doing this, and said deity will respond favorably to your pleas. This is, this is what's interesting. Religion has always been primarily a means for people to pray, right? Think about modern Christianity. We become Christians by praying, but often we don't become Christians to pray. 
And this is what's interesting. What we, when we read a passage like this, the Lord teaches us to pray. For many of our ears, we go, well, why would you need to learn how to pray? Because that's why we need the Lord, is so we have somebody to seek in prayer. Now, I just want to make clear, we're not saying there's a moral or spiritual or theological equivalent between world religions and the way to God through Christ. The difference between the way to God through Christ is he actually provides the means to interact with God through prayer. What I'm suggesting is through Christ, we finally have the way to walk into God's throne room and say, God, you got to hear me out. We finally have the way to do that, and that becomes really a sideline to most of our expression of faith. Let's look at an example of people who are seeking uh, prayer in religion. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26. One of the false religions in uh, Canaan was the worship of Baal. Of course, the people of Israel quickly picked this up. And Elijah has issued a challenge to the prophets of Baal, and he has said, listen, let's have a contest. We'll set up an offering, and uh, whichever, if Baal responds by burning up the offering, then he is God. If God responds by burning up the offering, then God is God. So we're just going to set up this contest. You guys get to go first, okay? So the prophets of Baal, they set up the offering. They arrange the offering on the altar, and they all day, uh, they're running around. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're chanting. Uh, they're doing fancy dances. I don't know what, they're, what the dances are, uh, but they're doing fancy dances. They have custom sabers that are designed for only one purpose. It's to cut their bodies to try to get Baal to pay, pay attention to them. So they would cut themselves. They would scream and yell. And then Elijah, of course, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, he starts talking prayer trash. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah, maybe, he's, maybe, he's, maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe you should yell louder to wake him up. So that, what I'm saying is this is in our minds. This is how false religion works. We have to get God to somehow listen to us. We need to dance around and scream and yell and cut ourselves and say this chant or this magic word or fairy dust or whatever we might do. How in the world are we going to get God to listen to us? And then we look at the cross and we say, oh, that's how we get God to listen to us. Jesus dies on the cross. And he says, you just come through me. I will take on myself all the yelling and screaming. I will be the one that provides access to the throne room of God that we might just walk in and say, God, I'm up creek. I got no paddle. I need you to show up right now. And God says, I hear you. I'm not going to accuse you of the sin that you've done. I'm not going to come because Jesus paid for all of that and provides us access. Pursue the Lord. Don't give up because he is kind. And I might suggest this. One of the primary reasons that Jesus has provided us salvation is that we would pray. Okay? Jesus died on the cross to provide us access to God himself. Certainly he provides us forgiveness. Certainly he provides us heaven forever. Certainly he provides us hope in the, in the difficult times of life. One of the primary things that Jesus did on the cross, if we believe the book of Hebrews, is provide us access to the Father to pray and what the friend pounding on the door tells us, we need to pound on the door and get in there. Jesus opened the door. Let's make sure we take full advantage of the access we are given. Go back to the disciples' prayer, Luke chapter 11, beginning of verse 1. We don't have time to look at it in detail, so just pointing out a couple of things. you find it, uh, Luke 11, verses 2, 3, and 4. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. I'm just going to make this one comment about this prayer. This is a prayer of dependency. God, I need you to give me what I need to eat. God, I need you to give me forgiveness. God, I need you to give me the strength to forgive the yahoos around me. And God, I need your kingdom to come because it turns out my kingdom's pretty lame. This is a prayer of dependence. And dependence is what we don't like. We want independence. We want self-reliance. We want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And prayer is fundamentally, I'm lost. I need you, God. I don't know what's going to happen here. If you don't show up, I'm host. And that's what this is a prayer of abject dependence. The disciples of the Lord's Prayer is a prayer of dependency, both spiritual and physical dependency. This parable is intended to illustrate and show us that God is a great one to depend on because he is kind, because he is a good father, he is not looking to trick us. 
He is looking to give us what is good and right according to his uh, purposes. Okay, we got to close a couple of quick things, if you don't mind. Again, as usual, I'm going to say it anyway. What does God get credit for in your life? Let me put it this way. Have you ever gotten in a position in your life where you say, why God? Something really bad happens and you say, God, why is this happening? And, and, you know, these are fantastic prayers. I always encourage all of us to keep praying these prayers, mostly because these prayers are fairly routine in the book of Psalms. So if the book of Psalms can ask why, you can ask why. So let's do that. But I want, I want us to pay attention to when we ask God why. You know, something terrible happens. Somebody gets sick, uh, suffers a significant loss, lose a job. Um, the Blazers get eliminated from the playoffs, whatever it might be. Why, God, why, why, why? Right? Something terrible happens. We find ourselves on the floor of a room. Why, God, oh, why is this happening? What have I done? We start confessing sins we, we, we hadn't done yet, but we we're planning on, but hadn't done it yet. You know? Why, oh, God? But think about it this way. Have you ever gotten the job you wanted, got the home loan, got the car, got accepted to that college, uh, finally got that business relationship you want dialed in, finally landed that big account, your kid was successful at school, or the kid got a great job, or, or, or you did experience physical healing? Have you ever had all these great things happen and you go home, close your door behind you, fall on your knees, why God? Have you ever done this? Why not? I'll tell you why. Because you're wondering. Because we think when things bad happen, God is up to something. And we think when something good happened, we were up to something. And we fail to recognize God is doing both. And what, why does this matter according to this discussion? If in our minds we think the only thing that happens when God moves is bad things, what would motivate us to pray to that guy? If we think the only time he ever shows up is to make things terrible, why in the world would I seek him in prayer? So what the enemy has done, he has convinced us when good things happen, it's because we're awesome. And when bad things happen, it's because God's an ogre. And with that formula, none of us are going to pray. The fact is, the good things that have happened were as much God as the difficult things, and we ought to be moved to pray because of the great things God has done, the great places we have to live. We get to live in this country. Can you believe it? We get to hang out with the people we uh, are connected with, our friends and our family. We have what we need, at least for today. And God is saying, look at everything I've given to you out of gratitude. Let's keep seeking him in prayer. He has given us this much. Hey, let's push it. Let's see if he'll do more especially in accordance with his kingdom purpose to glorify himself by reaching others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest obstacle to prayer is our wrong view of God. We think God's an ogre. And the fact is this, is, the, is God as good as the Bible says he is? And if we believe it, when we believe it, we'll start praying. Because why in the world wouldn't we seek the Lord when we know he responds with such goodness? So the issue here is that we don't pray enough. Maybe it is. I don't know. The issue is we think God's kind of a meanie. And why would I want to go spend time with him? And it's because we've had, gotten our minds a twist of what God is really like. Okay, one last suggestion just to help you in your prayer life. This doesn't come from me. It comes from one of uh, my ministry staff when we were discussing the sermon a week or two ago. I can't remember who gave me the idea, so uh, you can just credit all of them. Uh, have you thought about in your life of praying, having memorials? You see throughout the scripture, memorials being set up. When God works, a pile of stones, we're going to remember God helped us cross the Jordan River or, or these kinds of things. How do we remember God worked? God has been working in our life since the beginning, hasn't he? But a lot of times we're really forgetful. And he works, and so things are cool there. And then a few days go by, we forgot God even showed up in that really powerful way. What I might suggest in your own life, looking for ways to jot these things down. If you journal, write down, holy cow, God showed up. I can't believe it. Uh, if you're an electronic person, send yourself an email. Maybe you put it on your calendar for next year. God showed up, put it in next year's uh, calendar, date, and then you're going to be cruising along. You're going to get a reminder. God answered a prayer a year ago in this way, and you go, I totally forgot about that. We need to have memorials to remind us God is answering our prayers. Because so quickly we'll forget, and then when we go to pray again, we'll wonder, is God going to answer prayer? Well, it can help if we've reminded ourselves of all the ways God has shown up in the past. How can we be reminded of the ways God has provided in the past? All right, here's what we're going to do. Pursue the Lord, and don't lose heart, because he is just. Don't give up, uh, because he is kind.